Well, um, anyway, welcome to the third panel discussion of the DACOM DeFi 2021 Rising Tide series, which is brought to you by Securency, Solidus Labs, Global DCA, and Crypto Compare. As Alyssa mentioned, I'm James Harris. I'm Commercial Director at Crypto Compare, which is a global leader in digital asset market data. So this panel is entitled The Future of Trading Venues and Regulatory Outlook, and I'm excited to be joined by an elite set of industry leaders to talk about this. And I have Lisa Nesta, who is Senior Director of Ecosystem at Stellar Development Foundation. I have Hao Han Zhu, who is CEO of Epiphany. Pete Elkins, Head of Trade Surveillance and Market Health at Coinbase. David Nunes, Global Head of Global Link Execution Services at State Street. And our good friend, Khen Arad, the COO and co-founder of Solidus. As Alyssa mentioned, um, we have some prepared questions to the panelists, um, but uh, at around the 50 minute mark, I'll be hoping to take some audience Q&A. So please do use the Q&A function, type in the questions as they occur to you, and we'll tackle as many as we can. So without further ado, I'll hand over to my panelists for a brief introduction, and I'll start with Lisa. All right, thanks so much, James. So. Again, uh, my name is Lisa Nestor, and I am a senior director at the Stellar Development Foundation, where I work on our enterprise ecosystem team. Um, really just thinking about um, the Stellar ecosystem overall, business needs, um, working closely with a lot of our partners and thinking about how we can help them scale their business using Stellar. So <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Also really excited for the discussion. Thank you, Lisa. Haohan. Thank you, James. Uh, my name is Hao Han. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Epiphany. Um, so during my time at Columbia University, I did a lot of day trading equities and uh, algo trading crypto. Uh, I started the company while I was a senior there. Um, Epiphany is a digital asset trading network that aims to connect the fragmented marketplace in crypto. Uh, so we mainly service the institutional and VIP retail traders, and uh, we aim to provide them the best price discovery and liquidity available when trading digital assets. Thank you, Haohan. You are living the trader's dream there. Uh, Pete. <laughs> Hi, uh, Pete Elkins. Um, I run our trade surveillance and market health team over at Coinbase. Uh, Haohan, we probably uh, surveilled you at some point, maybe uh, in traditional finance as well. I uh, spent 15 years as a trader on the floor of the NYSC for Barclays and then transitioned using uh, levering my skills as a trader to uh, the regulatory space where I ran a, a few different teams at NYSC regulation for four years. And uh, uh, I levered that experience into opening up and running a first of its kind trade surveillance program and platform at Coinbase and monitoring and making sure our customers are safe. Thank you, David. And uh, thank you, James. Um, and I, I will, after this, go and open my curtains. I look a bit sinister. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I'll, I'll correct that in a second. But uh, I'm David Nunes. I am the global head of, uh, of head of Global Link Execution Services uh, at State Street. Global Link is State Street's independent trading platform business unit, and Execution Services within that consists of two trading platforms, FX Connect and Currentx. Now, the FX Connect platform is considered the largest FX trading platform in the real money space. So very much in, the, in this sort of institutional space we're talking about today. Uh, and Current X is a multi-asset class trading platform and trading infrastructure provider in the FX, US treasuries and digital asset space. And just over a month ago, State Street launched uh, State Street Digital, a new digital division, a new division dedicated to digital finance and Global Links uh, forming an integral part of that division. And I really appreciate being asked to join this panel and it's a privilege to be in such illustrious company. Uh, going open my curtain. <laughs> thank you, thank you, David, and and then, yeah. last but not least, thank you very much. Uh, such a pleasure to be here and uh, to host uh, this uh, series of events with uh, Crypto Compare, Security, and GDCA. I'm Chen. I'm Chen. Sorry, spelled Chen in English. Uh, in <laughs> I'm the one of the founders and COO of Solidus Labs. Uh, we are the uh, only uh, fully crypto native market surveillance and uh, risk monitoring hub tailored for digital assets. Uh, Citigroup recently uh, listed us as category definers for crypto market surveillance. We work with uh, exchanges, brokerages, increasingly uh, traditional institutions, and essentially anyone, and also increasingly regulators on uh, monitoring for, detecting, investigating, reporting, and preventing market manipulations and other forms of abuse. Uh, and also increasingly uh, uh, discovering a lot of new uh, ways people can try and do that in DeFi, which I hope we'll get to today. Uh, thank you. 
Thank you, Ken. Well, I'll try and extract the maximum from this set of panelists. Um, the uh, participants are, are overwhelmingly institutional, so it's going to be a very interesting discussion. Um, perhaps, Hauhan, um, at, at Epiphany, you have such a great vantage point of the digital asset exchange ecosystem because um, your customers can effectively use your services to connect to the various trading venues. Um, to set the scene for the panel, could you describe on a high level basis what this ecosystem currently looks like in terms of centralized and decentralized platforms and, and how users might interact with them? Yeah, sure. Um, so centralized and decentralized platforms serve very different purposes in the crypto market today. Um, although we've seen a lot of growth in DeFi, uh, particularly in DX space, Centralized platforms are still very dominant in terms of trading volume and other activities. Um, so much of the world today still has not adopted crypto yet, right? So centralized platforms like Coinbase serve as a very helpful gateway uh, from the fiat world to the crypto world. Um, so as we see more mainstream adoption in crypto, we, we would expect to see uh, these centralized platforms grow. Um, in terms of DEXs, um, they have actually been existing for a very long time. Uh, but only recently have they caught a lot of attention um, thanks to Uniswap uh, and its adoption of the automated market maker model. Um, so DEXs uh, cannot act as a gateway for fiat because fiat currencies will not operate on chain uh, until some country creates a working and open CBDC system. Um, DEXs today uh, just do a really good job following the mission of decentralized finance. Um, so taking Uniswap, for example, right? It decentralizes the role of exchanges and market makers, so allowing users to faci facilitate trades and provide liquidity without relying on the competence of a single centralized institution. So that is the value of DXs today. Um, and today, a lot of the crypto algo traders are actually very actively using both um, to, ex to execute arbitrage or other complex strategies. Uh, just treating DX as a, like another normal platform for liquidity um, to expand on that, um, so this type of usage actually highlights a serious marketplace fragmentation problem that involves both centralized and decentralized platforms. So uh, centralized markets as a whole, uh, crypto market as a whole, it's still very much behind the efficient market structure we have in traditional markets like equity. Uh, so each crypto exchange is their own marketplace and uh, there was no platform that unified them all. Um, if you think of Amazon, right? Amazon, they're actually a store of stores. So the biggest value they bring is informationalized merchandise that can only be discovered um, by a very limited group of people, whether that's a merchandise that's offline or a merchandise that's on a website that no one knows a lot about. Mm -hmm. um, so once Amazon informationalized all the information on a particular merchandise, people can compare prices and shipping speed and obviously choose the cheapest one with the fastest shipping um, on the same merchandise. Uh, so today's investor in crypto market are sort of living in an era that is sort of pre-Amazon. So they pay for a price that, that may not be the best on the same exact merchandise. Uh, so like th that's why you see varying prices on Bitcoin alone on different exchanges. Um, so that is why a lot of arbitragers are trading between exchanges very often. Uh, and when DEX has thrived, they kind of saw that as an additional opportunity and drove a lot of usage on DEXs. Thank you. I really appreciate that answer. Um, focusing on centralized exchanges uh, for the moment, a traditional one like the London Stock Exchange or, or a digital one like Coinbase are, you know, as Howan said, are effectively, you know, ful fulfilling the same function. Uh, perhaps they should be held to the same standards from a regulatory point of view. Um, David, what do you think about that statement? And how is State Street approaching centralized digital asset exchanges from an onboarding perspective? Are there any extra considerations? Uh, great question. I think, but first and foremost, I want to emphasize that until State Street has regulatory approval to trade cryptocurrencies and digital assets, we're not able to participate on any digital exchange. That's our, or indeed offer a digital exchange ourselves, although we are in constant discussions with the regulators and anticipate that that situation will change in the near future. So that's clearly the most salient consideration that we have uh, in front of us. Um, but to your question, so well, all DAXs are clearly not created equal uh, and exchanges like Coinbase and Gemini do have a well-deserved reputation and have successfully targeted the institutional participant base as a result of that. However, I think without the appropriate regulatory framework, then the institutional participants will not have the same degree of confidence in the DAXs that they could trade on as they have today with traditional asset exchanges. So obviously I think an appropriate regulatory framework that's consistent across jurisdictions 
um, is needed, although rather easier said than done. Um, but in answer to your statement regarding whether Coinbase should be held to the same standards as the LSE, well, I think that it absolutely should be the case. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, it, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it should be regulated like a duck or a DAX. So yes, I agree that a DAX should be regulated in the same manner as a traditional exchange. Uh, and I think it should be a positive development for the market. Um, and we've seen that at State Street. So we're very familiar with what it means to run regulated trading venues. Um, and that we operate two multilateral trading facilities uh, and a sort of execution facility in the FX market um, within the global link business with execution services. Um, our experience is that the standards around governance and transparency and controls, market surveillance, technology re requirements, um, that all kind of encapsulated in today's regulatory environment has been beneficial to the FX market mm -hmm. um, and has, in, has been embraced by the institutional space. And I think uh, essentially created a level playing field across exchanges. Um, not that I'm saying that Mifid 2 and Dodd-Frank are perfect uh, and that we should simply sort of adopt them wholesale and somehow shoehorn them into digital. I don't think that would be a very sensible approach at all. But similar, similar such regulatory clarity uh, in the digital space is one aspect that institutions are looking to. So as they know that they are compliant in terms of their participation on the venue and the venues that are trading on are similarly compliant in terms of what services they're offering. Uh, I think... In addition to that, there's, a, there's more complexity associated with digital assets that isn't uh, there in the, um, in the sort of traditional finance space, um, in that exchanges are also typically custodians. Um, and that's a, a model that sort of emerged from the crypto native and retail space. Large institutional participants in a traditional space are used to having their, asset, their assets custodied with global custodians, such as State Street, who as a, as a GCIFI, um, a globally systemically important financial institution, are amongst the most highly regulated entities in the financial services sector. Um, so, and that's and for good reason, right? Yeah. Um, in that we hold their assets in custody. So until there's regulatory clarity around organizations such as State Street, I think offering custody of digital assets, then that will reduce the appetite across the institutional space to participate more fulsomely um, in, uh, in digital. Uh, but that having been said, I think the, um, the, we, we have one potential direction of travel that, that we see is rather than just State Street sort of playing the role of We'll, we'll hold on to your wallets. I can, I can see that, that there will be a broader range or sort of array of use cases that our customer base will require of us in terms of, in terms of managing, holding their private keys, whether that's sub-custodian, uh, custody directly at State Street or self-custody even, but that sort of, but the orchestration of those different custody, the first of all, provision of those different options by, uh, as supported by a custodian like State Street, and then the orchestration and or harmonization of the experience of the institutions when it comes to uh, how their digital assets are custody, because they could be they di different digital assets could be custody in different ways. Um, I think that's where state street can very much play a, play a significant role. So that's a hypothesis that we're currently exploring is is, is essentially that sort of harmonisation and orchestration layer um, that the uh, to enable our, uh, our institutional customers to ultimately participate in the space more fortunately. Thank you, David. And um, on the basis of your, your answer, I'm extremely hopeful that um, State Street can enter the market sooner rather than, than later. I think the, the, uh, the analogy of the FX market and how that grew and became more regulated over time is probably a good one for crypto. Uh, so, so, so fingers crossed you'll be, you'll be joining the, the cohorts soon. Well, um, sorry, just, just on that point, just, sorry, just interrupt, I think that that's a good analogy. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of adjacency between cryptocurrency and, and FX. Um, I think that we don't have to take as much time um, in digital as we took in FX to going to get to where we need to get to. And we certainly can learn from that experience yeah. um, to actually accelerate that process. Yeah. And, and, and about quacking like a duck, um, there, there is, you know, there's some quarters that believe that uh, actually the standard is being held unnaturally high against digital assets, certainly in the context perhaps of a US ETF. So hopefully we can find this middle ground and, uh, and start moving forward with uh, what, is, what is clearly a new asset class uh, that is justified in pretty much all, all metrics. Um, moving on to de DEXs again, uh, the, how Anne, you mentioned a few, few, few points there, but really um, uh, certainly on the, the volume. So I've got some actual numbers uh, to, to sort of annotate. So DEXs uh, are averaging about $60 billion of turnover per month. And they have been doing for several months this year now, which, um, which, is, which is punchy in itself. Um, but, uh, but even punchier is the fact that it's up 60X from where it was this time last year. So uh, for context though, global 
spot digital asset market volumes on centralized exchanges average 3.5 trillion per month. So in other words, DEXs represent a small but rapidly growing part of the market. And Lisa, um, short straw for you, but could you drill down on what a DEX is and what its value proposition is to users, uh, perhaps in, uh, to, to su supplement some of our how hands uh, comments? Absolutely, um, happy to do that, James. So yeah, I mean, I think essentially decentralized exchanges are open marketplaces that are directly built into blockchains that enable users, whether they're retail or institutional, to trade peer to peer. Um, and so kind of as Halhan mentioned, uh, they differ from centralized exchanges and that there's not um, any central entity, for example, a Coinbase or an NYSE um, that's overseeing or directly enabling the ability of users to trade. Um, and so that's a, you know, that's a pretty big differentiator. Um, and so DEXs are able to do this because they utilize blockchains um, to execute direct, transparent, and programmatic trades between users. So some blockchains like Ethereum utilize smart contracts to execute this and others like the Stellar blockchain um, have a built-in order book as part of um, the ledger itself um, or also, you know, you can do both. You can, you can have uh, uh, smart contracts and a, and a built-in blockchain layer. So, um, you know, I think ultimately, and I apologize for the background noise. Ultimately, it's always Don't worry about it, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, the real kind of kernel of value that DEXs are delivering to the world is access. Um, I think it is, you know, the ability on both, um, you know, both the, the buyer and kind of the issuer or seller side to participate um, in a marketplace in a way that, um, you know, hasn't traditionally been available. Um, you know, I think they're going to kind of democratize, uh, democratize access to markets, but not even that, I think they're going to kind of reinvent and really challenge um, some of the ways that, um, you know, we, we regulate and um, control user interaction with various types of financial assets. Um, I think it's gonna be a, a really interesting couple of years ahead of us. Um, and so, you know, I think there certainly is a lot of room to grow with the development of, of DEXs and, you know, the growth has been huge. Um, in the last year, um, I think it's still really just the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of infrastructure components that are required to kind of make an open marketplace experience really seamless. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's innovations that are happening in this space. You know, we mentioned kind of liquidity pools and AMMs, like, you know, these were things that we weren't talking about really just two years ago. And so kind of the how quickly the space is evolving, um, I think is really exciting. But, you know, the ability for users um, increasingly anywhere in the world to be able to um, not only access different types of tokens, but these ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's really interesting. You know, um, if I'm a, you know, uh, an individual in Kenya and I can't really access my local infrastructure to get a good loan, um, you know, but suddenly I can use a, you know, a, a wallet to access a token, um, you know, through a DEX that gives me the ability to kind of borrow. Um, and again, there's a lot of infrastructure that has to be built up around this, but I think that that is um, the potential that this uh, technology offers us. Um, and it's going to be, um, you know, interesting to see both on the institutional and on the retail side, kind of the growth and onboarding of users into the marketplace. Thank you very much for that. Um, Pete, so we've set the scene a little and we've discussed the various trading venues. Um, we should also explore market integrity. Now, some of the panelists have touched on these points, um, but Coinbase is consistently rated in the top three of the exchanges that we, we track or crypto compare tracks in the exchange benchmark review, which grades exchanges across a whole host of metrics with a view to assessing overall counterparty risk. Um, could you talk a little bit more about trade and surveillance and market integrity on Coinbase? These are all these are areas where Coinbase actually consistently scores very highly. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. 
Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me too. This is uh, really a great opportunity. Um, one thing I think uh, reflecting. Uh, so I, I joined Coinbase in the beginning of 2018 from a regulated uh, a regulator looking at regulated markets. And one thing that really surprised me when I was joining and tasked with creating a trade surveillance program was uh, my initial fears coming into the space was that it was going to be ripe with manipulation, that there was going to be price uh, manipulation at the point of sale uh, rampant amongst most markets, and that this was um, something that everyone in traditional finance had spoken about. And I was shocked to find that once we did get our systems turned on and we started adding protections and really making sure that Coinbase was the most trusted exchange was not to say that manipulation is a non-event in crypto, but it certainly doesn't take place to the level that it, in sophistication that it does in traditional finance. That being said, that doesn't mean we don't have a, a, a task in front of us to make sure that our markets are safe and secure and that our customers can trade freely in our platform. And that's something that it has been important to us to build and perfect. Uh, we launched a regulated exchange level trade surveillance platform on our uh, program on our platform where we're looking for spoofing and wash trading and monitoring for all your traditionally monitored for regulated manipulations uh, and also one specific to cryptocurrency itself. Um, and, uh, you know, this has been a, uh, so to speak, a, a wild ride over the last three years in building this program, making sure that we're keeping our customers safe and adding these protections. On top of that, we've added layers of protections to our marketplace. You know, we've added uh, press protection points. We've uh, introduced rate limiting. We're trying to make sure that anyone either via API or through our consumer app or through our pro app, when they are interacting with our exchange, they're doing so in a safe uh, and, and, and they're encountering a fair and orderly market. And that's important to us. And, and that's what we're focused on. This conversation about DEXs brings up some interesting um, challenges from a surveillance. And, and let me also take a step back and, and say that I, I, I plus one with David talked about with uh, in terms of regulatory clarity, because that's very important to us. Um, I know that he said if, if they walk like a duck, uh, they talk like a duck. <laughs> uh, this is something that we're cognizant of. And, um, you know, we, we go out of our way to make sure that we have the protections and controls and systems in place that if a regulator came in and tomorrow and said, we're going to introduce these rules and regs, that we'd be ready to meet that standard. And we'd be, and we'd be again, the most trusted in the space. And that's important to us. And we're spending a lot of money around making sure that we have those right controls and the right people in place. Um, but uh, the DEX is, again, it's an interesting uh, conundrum from a surveillance standpoint and something I'm sure uh, some people on this panel will, will talk to. But, you know, from a Coinbase perspective, we want to give people as much access to the crypto economy as possible. So, you know, we view DEXs as a great opportunity, uh, as I could refer to Brian's post, uh, his blog post recently, where he talked about the space. Um, it's something that is top of mind for us and uh, not a, a competitor in that sense, but, but something that's complementary and something that will help, uh, you know, grow because, the, what DEXs bring to the market, um, you know, this, this liquidity generating feature, the ability for retail clients to add liquidity at the point of sale is similar to what centralized exchanges need. And what we're monitoring for at, on Coinbase is making sure that we have the depth and liquidity at the point of sale. We believe liquidity begets liquidity, which is the standard axiom. Uh, and, that, and that rings true with our 56 million customers uh, plus on Coinbase, we're seeing that liquidity build and create more stable, healthy books. But how does that translate into DeFi will be an interesting question as we move forward for sure. Yeah, no, no indeed. Uh, um, a couple of things you said there. Um, you're always you're monitoring for these bad behaviors, spoofing, wash trading, that sort of stuff. But in, in the top rated exchange cohort, anecdotes with the anecdotal questions I've had with the exchanges, actually instances of that behavior is surprisingly low. Um, when you do find people, what do you do? Do you throw them in the sin bin, in the naughty box? How does it work? <laughs> Great question. So um, one thing I guess I can comment on that's interesting from our standpoint is there's a lot of education in the space, right? A lot of our customers don't even know that we're running programs like this, right. and we're working hard to get that word out there. Um, a lot of customers in the space in general don't know that there are exchanges running protections like this and looking at the point of sale and looking for transaction metrics. But um, one thing we do do is we reach out to the customer 
make sure that they are aware that what they're doing is challenging our rules and the norms and what normal trading behavior should look like. So we, we certainly do a lot of education, give them that chance to understand that what they're doing may be spoofing or wash trading. And, and, and once we're once we're convinced that they have a full understanding and education over what we don't want on our platform, we'll give them that chance to interact again. And if uh, we see a breach again, we're going to have to take action. And, and, and that action is limited to obviously keep, uh, keeping somebody off the platform, yeah. making sure our other customers are safe. But what's super interesting in this space compared to my life as a regulator was this education piece. I actually enjoy reaching out to customers and saying, you see what you're doing here is what a traditional exchange would look at and say is spoofing. Um, we don't want that on our platform. This kind of behavior can exist. And, and we'll get lots of, uh, lots of folks who are just learning about this type of activity, uh, right or wrong. Um, and uh, education is a large part of uh, our job uh, description these days, for sure. I really appreciate that uh, that answer. Thank you. And, um, and look, Solidus Labs, one of our partners for this event series, um, they offer a range of market surveillance and risk mon uh, monitoring services to exchanges. Ken, we've we've heard a little bit from Pete and, and Coinbase, but how do you see this function evolving across the ecosystem? Um, and if you have time, how do you see Dexas fit, fitting into that picture? First of all, I have to say, I'm just enjoying listening to everyone so much. These are exactly the kind of conversation that we uh, have had in mind when DACOM was founded. So thank you all for being here. You know, first of all, I do want to kind of address this idea of, of crypto as the new kid on the block. Um, and, you know, being, uh, you know, often being kind of seen as, as Wild West and over scrutinized. I mean, it's a natural thing for, for new markets to be over regulated or over scrutinized. Um, you know, it's... Uh, uh, but at the end of the day, I also, but, but I mean, we, we can also understand why regulators would want to, you know, be a little bit more careful here. Uh, we have more to prove. And I think we're all up to the task uh, in this industry. Um, and I guess on, on that note, like a little bit on, you know, on surveillance and crypto markets and, and trends there, um, it's actually quite remarkable when we founded the company a few years back, we would go to a very regulatory oriented, uh, uh, we, we would go to a very regulatory oriented crypto uh, is conference, for example, one about security tokens, right? Doesn't get more regulatory oriented than that. We would mention uh, market surveillance and people would uh, raise, out, raise their eyebrows, right? They wouldn't even understand what we're talking about in the context of crypto. I think it's fair to say that's no longer the case. Um, you know, uh, James, I'm, I can reference your benchmarking report. The numbers, the percentage of crypto exchanges ranked by crypto compare that are already using uh, externally provided market surveillance are still relatively low, I believe around 10%, yeah. but growing. Um, and you know, we, we can, and it's a result of course of uh, increasing regulation, also just a recognition that we need to protect investors. It's no longer the days of, you know, uh, Jesse Powell, the CEO of Kraken uh, saying, crypto traders don't care or want protection for market manipulation. I don't think he would, uh, uh, you know, I don't think anyone would say that today. Um, but uh, at the same time, you know, obviously there are challenges. I'm sorry, I'm just uh, plugging in to the battery because I was running low. Um, you know, at the, the way we think about uh, market uh, manipulation in crypto space is, is the no, you know, there are no knowns like wash trading and spoofing that takes place very similarly in the crypto space. There are known unknowns because you can potentially, and you know, we see that, uh, you know, you do wash trading and spoofing in, a, in very different ways, in, even in centralized crypto markets. And then there's the question of the unknown unknowns, the new typologies we're constantly discovering. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, three, you know, in the last bull run 2017, we would see a ton of what we call uh, wholesale uh, forms of manipulation. The industry was still relatively young. Um, needless to say, there were actors who were much more on top of it, like Coinbase, of course, like you mentioned, uh, Pete. But, uh, you know, it was a different ballgame. In this bull run, we, you know, in places that we have visibility into the trading, we don't see that as much. What we do see, you know, definitely in places that are actively like Coinbase uh, working to, uh, to, uh, to monitor for these and, and prevent them in various ways. What we do see are more and more very specific crypto native forms of manipulation, uh, utilizing crypto's different market structures, uh, data structures. The fact that regulation is still kind of being figured out uh, and other elements of the market. Um, of course, there are also things that still need to be addressed. And uh, you know, uh, James, you mentioned the SEC's rejections of Bitcoin ETFs. 
it's at the end of the day due to uh, a very spe crypto specific concern, right? Uh, the, the, they're basically saying in all of the rejections, I think I read most of them at this point, that uh, they're not convinced that shared market surveillance is possible right. in an ecosystem where the assets are not native to any single exchange. Yeah. The way we see it is they're basically saying, prove to us that it is possible. Um, and addressing that, you know, but while by working with other crypto, uh, uh, with many other entities in the space, including Crypto Compare, of course, and others, is really you know a task that, that we need to take. We're taking on in order to show that this can be a regulated industry. Um, um, but of course, we're still talking about centralized. You know, uh, we love the word decentralization in crypto. The majority of trading is still centralized. But then it comes to you know if, if market manipulation, fraud. Um, Malicious activity in crypto markets is the new frontier. DeFi is the new new frontier, and uh, you know you have super exciting, you know, new ideas like NFTs that suddenly pick up, and a million people, you know, tons of people start, you know, trading them. And you know, someone asked me, for example, a journalist asked me recently, is Mark is uh, what is uh, uh, is is money laundering possible on NFTs? You know, the answer is of course, anywhere where it's traded and, and there needs to be monitoring for it. But, um, you know, so, so obviously when things are constantly, new things are constantly introduced, people, you know, get excited, FOMO kicks in and people don't necessarily educate themselves and make sure that they're careful. But again, it's, a, you know, I, I think there's uh, no question that uh, crypto and DeFi are, uh, uh, you know, restructuring the way financial services work. At this point, I think very few people will doubt it. What's really exciting is that they're not just doing that, they're also transforming the way financial services will be regulated. Regulators understand uh, that, you know, to supervise these markets, the, the, the same, uh, you know, uh, um, frameworks are not going to, you know, necessarily work in the long run, definitely as DeFi continues to pick up. Uh, and they're very open to new ways to monitor for risks. Uh, Pete mentioned accessibility, which is a really important part. And I'll finish with that. Um, Pete mentioned accessibility, which of course is one of the holy grails of crypto. Crypto is a retail first ecosystem, um, but traditional finance in a way risk was very much based on being able to scrutinize who can actually use the market, right? Who, can, who has access to it. It's much easier to be kind of confident of the stability when, when you know more clearly who the actors are. When you open it, and that's really important more accessibility to capital markets for a plethora of reasons, um, you know, you have less of those blocks in the entrance. And really the key to uh, safe markets becomes becoming much more surgical and effective and efficient in identifying actually malicious behavior yeah. using new technologies, crypto native technologies, uh, machine learning, in addition, of course, to best practices from risk monitoring traditional finance in order to do that. And I believe that uh, crypto in that sense is an opening for the future of financial risk monitoring, not just to the future of financial services. Thank you, Ken. So um, I'm going to switch speed, as Alyssa says, to um, a slightly different um, uh, format and um, have a little bit more discussions around these questions that I'm going to ask. Um, so we often hear, heard it said that in order for a new product or service to be adopted, it has to be 10x better than the incumbent version. And uh, the CEO of FTX, who's been in the news quite a lot in the last few days, Sam Bankman Freed, and he also spoke on Monday, he said that um, crypto will only stand the test of time if it can produce great products and services. So um, starting with the uh, the DEXs then, I mean, are they are they 10x better, How Han, at the moment? Um, okay, so <laughs> before I dive in, I, I want to say I absolutely have a lot of love for Coinbase, and uh, we're, we're actually, we have a lot of activities there as well. Um, yeah, so the above said, you already know where I'm going with this. <laughs> Um, I think they absolutely are. Uh, and a lot of people would agree with me based on data, right? So if you look at the recent on-chain data, um, more than 3 million addresses have interacted with DeFi protocols and uh, 2 million of them have at least uh, interacted with Uniswap at least once. So to put that into perspective, 2 million users is the amount of users that some of the major centralized exchanges had in 2016, which is only five years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and it took them years to grow that number. Uh, so a lot of people definitely think it is better. Um, so to expand on that, so if you are going to compare the models of CEXs and DEXs, CEXs often operate on a central limit order book model where, um, where a lot of traditional uh, markets do. Um, so where the centralized exchange controls the facilitation of the trades to completion and the centralized market makers provide liquidity and reap most of the awards in the form of rebates. So uh, how it typically works is market makers typically get anywhere from, you know, one to three basis point 
per trade and traders are paying something like five to 50 basis point in fees per trade. And exchanges thus have a super lucrative business from taking the cut in the middle. Uh, so DX is better um, in ways I mentioned before, right? So they decentralize a lot of roles that can typically only be taken on by sophisticated institutions mm -hmm. and allow anyone to play a part of that role. So taking Uniswap, for example, uh, what they did is essentially they used automated market make model to decentralize the role of market makers to the people. So uh, that, that allowed people to reap the benefits of market making and take on the risk, but in a much easier way. Uh, and, and also the facilitation of the trades is the protocol that's doing that. So yeah. you no longer need the sophistication nor the capital uh, requirement to become a market maker. Um, so I think it is a really smart model because it is an effective way to draw liquidity and make the market more efficient quickly. Yeah, and I guess just the fact that people can interact with an exchange with their MetaMask wallet or other other wallets exist, of course, as well. But they can also issue a loan. They can take down a loan. They can uh, store their NFTs. So effectively, with one with one thing, you can access many things. And of course, the network effects there uh, grow exponentially. Um, Lisa, do you have any any points to add on? on the yeah, I mean, I agree with everything you both just outlined, and I think there's just a qualifying point to your question, which is to whom, right? And I think that's a big part of this, which is that, um, you know, uh, there, there are plenty of individuals who don't have, um, you know, quite as easy access to certain types of financial services in the world. And so, yeah, I mean, I think when you, if, if what you're looking to do is just trade crypto on Coinbase or, you know, like, you know, buy some, buy some Bitcoin, then for an average American, like that experience might not be that different. But if you're, you know, A, don't have local exchanges that are that accessible, then, you know, global access is, is I think, long term, much easier around DEXs. But, you know, also, just like you said, the ecosystem of products, the ability for mm -hmm. an individual with $10 to put it into an AMM and suddenly like be able to um, you know, benefit and earn yield from, a, you know, a protocol that does that, they don't have to have that sophistication themselves. So yeah. I think um, there is a lot of value on the table, particularly as we start to get to the edges and have more participants, um, you know, uh, accessing DEXs. And, I, you know, obviously, there's a lot of um, UI and product layers that need to be developed in, in that universe as well. And I don't think that they're even right now, but um, yeah, I just think the, the value is not going to be the same for every participant in the market, or it isn't right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to conflate a, a question uh, that I had planned to ask you later on. But of course, DeFi is, is, is more than just decentralized trading venues, as, you, as you've just said. And Joe Lubin just referred to it as the first time that individuals can gain economic agency. That's a really exciting thought. Um, so, so it's a parallel system that's being built here, really. Um, you clearly think it has leg, legs, but, you know, in a microcosm, uh, what excites you about it? Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, we're we're already seeing pieces of it on Stellar, which is something that's really exciting to me. So, um, you know, <clears throat> Stellar is very focused on payments. We also have a built-in DEX and we're increasingly looking for ways that, you know, we can help any individuals who touch Stellar get access to the most interesting, you know, assets and products in the digital asset space, right? So I think when we see uh, a payments company in Tanzania um, build a product on Stellar that allows for small and medium businesses um, in Tanzania to execute corporate payments, um, you know, more, more easily across the world, whether they're receiving or sending, right? But then suddenly it's like, okay, well, um, once you have access to your own, you know, wallet, once you have access to assets like USDC, for example, you can kind of gateway jump into other products that maybe provide you more interesting treasury services, right? Suddenly you can hold um, parts of your balance sheet and earn yield on them. And that product totally didn't exist for you, um, you know, last year, <laughs> like yeah. two years ago. And so I think um, there is a ton around um, individual corporate and especially small and medium businesses, like how they're gonna be able to own and utilize their capital. 
in the marketplace. And, you know, this is, I think, when people say disintermediating the banks, this is a big piece of it. Um, You know, suddenly, like, I don't just kind of hand over my money. Um, I can be, I can participate more directly in markets, um, you know, as a lender or even as a borrower, right? If that's um, something that I'm interested in. So, yeah, yeah, I think um, the access to tokens was really just the beginning. Um, And now it's kind of all of these products that we're able to allow people to participate in, um, many of them kind of programmatic. uh, And, you know, it's, um, it opens up global marketplaces in a way that we haven't seen yet. Yeah, no, no, thank you. And look, David, um, again, changing, changing tack a little bit. So Joe Lubin said that institutions are massively into DeFi. Um, The emphasis on that statement surprised me. Uh, uh, you know, t- to be honest, I, th- I thought that was that was quite a punchy statement. Um, I think that uh, a lot of institutions are just getting comfortable with the top 10 coins and tokens um, and are just about getting comfortable trading at the top rated regulatory exchanges. Um, but, but David, from your perspective, and granted State Street isn't there, there yet, but is DeFi on their radar? Or have, you, have you seen anything to suggest that they're participating directly or indirectly in the space? And what barriers can you think of for your, for your customers? Well, thank you, Joe. So I think that um, I, I would certainly agree that there's a there's a tremendous amount of interest uh, and an awful lot of enthusiasm about what the technology represents. Uh, and I think that's been covered very effectively by my fellow panelists. Um, I would point out an interesting thing about this, uh, just, to, just to go back to the previous question. I had a comment about the um, decentralized exchanges versus decentralized. And I feel that it's not that one will win out, um, mm. because if we, especially if we look at the sort of, uh, there is a there's a symbiotic relationship between uh, centralized and decentralized exchanges, especially around the automated market making functionality, which is that without the arbing, the, the arbitraging that goes on um, between the centralized exchanges and the automated market makers, then you're not going to actually maintain an appropriate price point for those for those tokens on the AMM. So that arbing mechanism is crucial to the behavior, to the performance or DM or the uh, the functionality of the of that decentralized exchange from that perspective. So there is this, there is this, there's this kind of ongoing relationship. And I, I don't think that'll be that'll, that'll going to go away because it feels like it's sort of necessary for that um, part of the equation to be uh, to to be hit. But in terms of your question around um, institutions and and sort of adoption, so I think excitement is very different to adoption. Right. Uh, I, 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 I would even say that um, that they're not, uh, and I would say that the majority of institutions are comfortable with with uh, with trading the top ten coins or uh, on the top three exchanges either. I don't think they. I don't think there are certainly institutions which are comfortable doing that. But I would consider them to, consider them to be within the institutional space, um, sort of early adopters of the technology, rather than a representation of the uh, of the majority of I mean, mm. it's a huge, huge community. The institutional space, so mm. uh, which is why it's so exciting uh, for the digital asset space that the institutional space is sort of getting uh, it's paying so much attention to it. But there are some real barriers to entry for institutions at the moment when it actually comes to participation. So I think that the the the, uh, the sort of relationship between um, or the pressure between uh, the interest and the actual ability to execute is, is really there, and I yeah. think that there's a lot of re- so there's a, a general I wouldn't say it's a general accept uh, sort of acceptance, but there's certainly a hypothesis that that DeFi represents a potential future infrastructure for the entire financial services space. And Joe very much sort of painted that picture of in the future everything will be DeFi and will be um, and will be spent and everything that we ever do will be sort of managed by DAOs, which is uh, which is a very interesting picture. And I, I I do question whether we'll be there in ten years' time, um, given the pace of some of the or given the capacity of some of the participants in the marketplace. And again, I hark back to the regulators; they have a limited capacity when it comes to actually be able to formulate new regulation um, and apply the necessary sort of horsepower to to that activity. Uh, so there's so, so firstly there's that regulation that is that everyone is looking at. How do I actually um, adopt DeFi? How do I use DeFi? How do I access it in a compliant manner? Um, and, and I think Joe also touched on a number of points around that. Regulating the technology providers seems to be a, a bit of a rabbit hole or a, or a sort of false start. I feel that it's regulation. It's regulating the participants who actually want to carry out activities that's, that's going to be where the um, the focus should be. Uh, mm-hmm. Rather than trying to stifle innovation uh, by by regulating technology providers, uh, I think the other uh, factor to consider that I think that's uh, that, that's sort of a, a, a major consideration is um, is security and fraud. Now, in institutional space, uh, cybersecurity is like one of the top major issues or risks that the firm that firms focus on. Uh, and I think at the moment, 
Um, you could say that within DeFi, there's there's a lot of focus around smart contract, uh, about our own smart contract risk. Um, uh, the I think that the that there's concern around around fraud. I read that um, I think that 70% of um, of of, of uh, institutions believe that there are some, that the security concerns over fraud were preventing company-wide adoption of DeFi, and that was a research carried out by Crypto and BCP uh, Platinian. And then um, I think that the uh, there have been incidents, and quite high-profile incidents of of um, of, uh, of acts of uh, actions being carried out, like the DeFi lending platform um, uh, BZX being attacked, um, but, you know, allowing there's I think, an Oracle. Uh, the Oracle price of collateral to be changed, and then there's 70, the very well publicised seventy-two million dollars worth of assets being from smart contracts being stolen from um, from the DAO. Mm -hmm. So critics of DeFi point towards those as being incidents to not consider adoption, and certainly there's hesitancy associated with that. Um, the other sort of big issue is uh, AML KYC, which has been mm -hmm. touched on by others, hugely important for institutions. Um, so to sort of match to, 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 to match the um, sort of C5 fraud prevent, prevention and security levels, there needs to be some way to adopt the AML KYC measures that we have to, that, we, that, we, that are prevalent in institutional space, which is, I think, a really interesting challenge because one of the, what, what, we were talking about um, DeFi and its benefit and, and the benefits around it being open and open banking and, and, and of course, around sort of a blockchain and decentralized trust in general, the concept of, cen of, sort of censorship Seems to be the other, the, the, the sort of the other side of AML KYC. Um, mm -hmm. I just don't think, and I, I was listening to um, Donnie from Securency yesterday, making a very, I think, pretty impassioned case around the fact that uh, we do not want to be encouraging or participating in um, in in, uh, in applications where we know that money laundering is going on, that the proceeds of of of, uh, of crime are being laundered, where um, or uh, or or human sex trafficking, or uh, you know, it's all, it's not a world that we that we that is uh, in any way something that we think is that should not be addressed mm -hmm. and addressed addressed fulsomely. Uh, and I think that the the question is, how do you maintain the benefits of DeFi's permissionless nature, um, and at the same time um, enable um, institutions to engage with it? By having that AML KYC sort of hygiene around it, um, mm -hmm. so I think that's that that's a that's a kind of an, an, an interesting uh, sort of area. And my concern would be that you end up in um, in a situation where you end up with silos in DeFi of the DeFi world, which is all around um, compliance and AML KYC, and then the open world, which is not. And I think that would be that that would not be helpful. There has to be some some solution to ensuring that the that, that we can benefit from the economies of, uh, the, you know, the, from the, the overall openness of the entire ecosystem mm -hmm. um and then the uh, but then i have seen instances where i think that uh, that, that Abe is has actually opened up a uh, uh, some commissioned um pool which is to Abe pro uh, which seems to be an indication that uh, that DeFi is, is taking it seriously and come, trying to come up with DeFi solutions to that, which I think is probably the answer to, this, to the issue here is, is not solutions that get imposed from the outside, but, is, but solutions that are actually part of the protocol. Um, and that would be absolutely fantastic. And I think I covered the kind of administration and custody side of things. And then um, I think there's also a bit of a capital allocation issue as well uh, yeah. around some, a lack of infrastructure and services needed to, uh, to operate sort of large transactions um, at an institutional scale. And then there's always this sort of the lack of, of sort of robust on-ramp, off-ramps. Um, again, which Joe alluded to, we're still going to have to go back into fiat um, from digital. And when we do, whenever we do that, we need to do it in a in a sort of regulatory compliant fashion that uh, addresses all the kind of concerns around ML, KYC, and so on and so forth in a, in a way that enables efficient allocation of capital. So it's, it's quite a lot of it. I've got a, a laundry list of issues. Yeah, um, but, I, but I, I didn't ask a broad question. So no, th thank thank you for those. Yeah, I think offset by the fact that yeah, the passion around around the technology and the the attention it's been getting, I think, is going to lead to innovation that will address these issues over time. Yeah, no, thank you. And um, um, I, 
uh, just wanting to pick up a few audience questions as well. I, ha I have one, one more of my own, but first you mentioned on AML KYC compliance on the, on the DeFi side, um, Kevin Donahue asked the question, are there any technology solutions? And you have kind enough to mention our, one of our uh, co-partners, Securency. Uh, they're certainly a, a firm that you should look at. Chen, um, also obviously you provide such solutions. Um, perhaps uh, are there any other names that Kevin should be thinking about just in, in list form, no need to elaborate on? You're if asking me to recommend competitors? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's just, it's just... I'm just, no, I'm just kidding. I mean, uh, uh, honestly, there's you no, know, so definitely addressing uh, market integrity and, and creating the sort of hygiene that you're describing is not a one company job. There are multiple companies okay. that are doing great work here, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the AML side, Genalysis, Elliptic, Cyphertrace, TRM, uh, uh, Labs, uh, Merkle Science are just a few examples. And then there's also the question of, you know, the fact that you need multiple, you know, uh, compliance and risk data points and managing them in one place, which is something we help our clients with, but happy to pick it up at any point, uh, David. Yeah. Uh, well, it's a growing and exciting ecosystem, crypto risk monitoring. Yes, yeah, speaking of... Um... Of supporting competitors, um, we have to talk just very briefly about the incredible capital raise that FTX secured uh, that was announced yesterday, nine hundred million dollar raise into an eighteen billion dollar uh, valuation, and um, I spotted Coinbase on the um, the new investor round. So that was uh, that's an incredible statement by Coinbase. Uh, they clearly aren't trying to win the space. Uh, they're they're looking to to support the ecosystem. Um, Pete, you know, what's your, what's your thinking here? Obviously you've got DEXs as a potential competitive threat. Um, you're in it for the ecosystem really, aren't you? <laughs> no, this is, um, while I can't really comment on the actual investment itself, what I can say is that, um, like you just mentioned, it speaks volumes about how we view the ecosystem and how we view what Lisa had uh, said a little bit earlier was access, right? So it's important for us to make sure that our customers have access to the best parts of this ecosystem, right? The crypto economy cannot thrive unless there is broad access to all parties uh, in some equal nature. So we're working hard to figure out how we can provide our customers with access to other systems, markets, pools of liquidity that increases uh, their ability to benefit from this ecosystem and, and also will benefit the ecosystem in general, right? Um, as I mentioned before, liquidity begets liquidity. If we can find pools of liquidity on these DEXs and we can provide the fiat rails and then provide the, the potential of hosting uh, on a secure and most trusted standard uh, their wallets, then we can provide that safe uh, uh, avenue or boulevard into crypto, uh, into the DeFi space in general. And that's important to us. And that's something that, uh, you know, this investment speaks loudly to that, you know, this is, um, uh, we're a partner uh, in this uh, growing ecosystem and we want to see it thrive. Uh, so the brightest minds and the best companies out there are going to interest us in, in helping us uh, get the entire economy to that next level. So um, and that access, the fact that how Han said that, um, you know, fiat rails are not um, uh, indigenous to uh, DeFi, so to speak. So you, you're going to need those standard DeFi rails uh, or the fiat rails into DeFi. And that's where someone like Coinbase comes in, where we can protect our customers, make the whole experience uh, as simple as possible, but also make it great uh, and give them as much access as possible. So that's, that's things that are top of mind for us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pete. Now, a completely uh, left field question here uh, from, from an anonymous attendee, unfortunately. Do, do, uh, do provide your name in, in, in future. Um, the industry is growing. There are a lot of people coming from traditional, uh, Pete, you're one, I'm one uh, several years ago now. Um, but also it's attracting a lot of incredibly bright young people. And, um, and one of our attendees is asking, uh, Halhan, and perhaps you can answer this. What advice do you have for someone looking for a crypto job? Uh, you know, you, you, you went straight from university into it, into trading and then building an incredible business and attracting um, lots of people to work with you. Uh, what advice could you give? Um, I, I think the, the least you could do is uh, to be a user. Um, so what got me into the space was that I was a super user of GDAX back then, which is now Coinbase Pro. Um, and, and during the, I, I was actually trading equities before doing a lot of day trading. And during the use of GDAX, um, I also discovered Gemini uh, like a, a year later. 
And I actually realized, you know, the, the price of Bitcoin is actually very different across the two venues. Like you don't see this in equities, right? You don't use TD Ameritrade and Robinhood and find like different prices on like Apple stock or something like that. So, um, so when I was using GDAX and Gemini, I kind of realized there was a huge price difference on Bitcoin uh, back then. And I just kind of looked into it why. And that's how I realized the crypto market structure was very different from equity. And it was just super fragmented and traders, like investors just can't get the best price discovery at any given time. So that's why I built the company on top of the problem I encountered. So um, so I think part of understanding the crypto industry and the problems there is um, to be a super user. Yeah. Thank you. And, and, and Lisa, I'm, I'm sure um, you get inundated with CVs as well. Could you could you add a, a, an extra comment there? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think uh, Halvin's comment's really great. I, I would just add to that that um, it's, crypto is technology. Uh, and ultimately, I think people who understand use cases, understand problems, understand um, you know, uh, areas of expertise that are around that technology, it's all extremely valuable. So um, I always tell people, like, don't um, come into crypto thinking that, you know, you need to be a crypto trader, for example, like that is a really important thing. And I think it's great to use these products and understand like wallet structures and liquidity and all of these things are very important. But you know, payments on the stellar world is super relevant. And we're always looking for people with that type of experience. And NFTs, it may be, um, you know, something totally de debt financing is huge in this space right now. Like understanding how we move from something like, uh, you know, retail kind of open markets to more business and institutional uh, raising of finance. There's like a lot of areas. And so I think having a passion for the technology, um, learning a lot, using it, but then also having confidence in your own areas of understanding and looking for those gaps is a really um, valuable place to enter the market. I totally agree with that, Lisa. And, and, and I'll look, I'll, I'll give my two cents on the matter. Just because this is a technology driven industry doesn't mean that other skills aren't massively in demand. You know, you have the archetypal dev founder and their geniuses and you look around, uh, you, you find them, but they're nothing without brilliant salespeople around them. So if you've got an ability to articulate an idea, to convince people to join a cause, um, that is massively in demand and is as important as any product out there you know we we often see products that look fantastic but die on the on, on the on the proverbial tree because effectively there's been no distribution so don't be disheartened if you've got a story to tell and you can tell a story uh this space is also for you um so so i think look we're 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 right on the the half hour now uh i've really enjoyed today's discussion a really diverse set of as i mentioned elite panelists um I'm sure you know, if we can just quickly um, go, go do a round robin and say to people how, the, how you can be reached uh, for more information. Um, Ren, how can they reach you? Uh, first of all, in relation to the former question, uh, we're hiring, so you're welcome to there visit we the career page of our website, <laughs> uh, anonymous uh, uh, attendee. Uh, yeah, I mean, feel free to reach out to me at any point at uh, chen, C-H-E-N, at salvaduslabs.com or through our website. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, th this has been tremendously exciting. Thank you for, moder for for this moderator and everyone else for participating. Thank you. And, and Lisa, how can you be reached? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> over email at lisa.stellar.org or if you like Twitter world, I'm Nestorius828. Nice. Howhan, Twitter? Yeah, just Twitter or LinkedIn. I'm usually pretty responsive. And also just at howhan at epiphany.com. Yeah. Thank you. And, and, and David, perhaps you can't give your State Street address away, but, um, but perhaps so people can, can go to the domain. What do you think? Oh, no, LinkedIn is fine. So I'm on LinkedIn and we are also hiring uh, at State Street Digital. So I also want to put that out there. And it's been a tremendous pleasure. Thank you very much, Mindy James, for moderating. Absolute, absolute pleasure, Pete. And uh, I, I, I guess Coinbase gets quite a few requests. Um, yeah, we're uh, we're actively hiring, looking for great problem solvers. So please submit. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, happy to continue this discussion. And thanks so much. This is um, uh, these discussions always go for a, a long way in, in pushing us ahead. So I appreciate it. So thank you very much for everyone, for our panelists, and for the participants. Mm -hmm.